thank you so much for inviting me to, to come over here today. Um, assessment and feedback is, is really the thing that gets me out of bed in the morning, which is really not a very good um, admission to make. It makes me sound a little bit sad. But this is the thing that I get really excited about, and so um, I'm hoping to share some of these insights with, with you today. I have uh, been involved with uh, the work of the, the National Forum um, with colleagues in other areas of Ireland. So I have a little bit of an insight into how um, the system works over here and how it's different to um, the system in England. But I'm also really keen to, to, to learn from you. So please do feel free to um, say if things that I'm talking about would be very, very different in the context in which you work um, and, and, and let me know so that I can gain more <coughs> insight into, into your own context and the ways in which things work for you. So for the first hour um, today, I'm going to talk about um, the way in which we can align learning outcomes, the work that we do with students in timetabled sessions, and then the way in which we assess their learning. And think about how we align these, but I'm going to take an approach where we will start to deconstruct some of the terms that we often talk about in this context. Things like assessment for learning, things like learning objectives. What do we actually mean by, by these kinds of terms? One of the things that um, I want to talk about today as well is this idea of authentic assessment that we don't just need to focus on essays and exams or multiple choice questions, but thinking about being quite innovative in, in how we assess students' learning and why that is important. Um, and we'll, we'll give you the opportunity to think about how that might work in the, the context of your own discipline, being very aware that there's probably lots of different disciplines represented here today. Then going to come on to feedback. And um, the reason... I want to do this is because for me feedback and assessment are really part of, of the same thing. Feedback is not just this thing that happens afterwards but we, the way in which we design assessments will influence the way in which students engage with feedback and the way in which they use feedback. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And then introduce you to um, an approach to think about mapping modules um, or units, programmes, um, and think about where we can put in place opportunities for students to learn through assessment and to engage with feedback. Then after the break, you have the opportunity to map um, a module or a programme of, of, of your choice and start to think about how you can build in opportunities for students to learn through assessment. So in terms of the, the, the learning outcomes, some of these I'm only going to be able to cover um, in uh, quite brief detail because of, of the time that we've got. But I have given you, um, there's a handout with some, well, they might be useful references, links um, to things that you can follow up on. Um, because different theoretical approaches and the way in which we can use these resources to inform design. I could probably talk for several hours about that. Um, so I'm going to keep it really brief, but just point you towards some um, really useful resources. One of them I will just flag up um, that I've put on there is the Assessment Design Decisions Framework. So this was developed by a team um, in Australia and it's a brilliant resource. Um, it enables you to, to really think about what kind of questions you need to ask yourself when designing an assessment. Um, all sorts of uh, different things that can be taken into account. And within those resources themselves are further links. It becomes a bit of a, you know, you jump down a rabbit hole and keep finding more and more things to follow up on. But I would definitely recommend um, the Assessment Design Decisions Framework. A really good tool when you're thinking about um, designing assessment tasks. <coughs> Okay, so this first question of theoretical approaches to assessment and feedback. There's one really key shift that I want to flag up um, today, and that really is what we might call a, a paradigm shift. At least it's, it's, it's going in that direction. And the key difference that we're seeing in the way in which we think about assessment and the way in which we think about feedback is moving away from what, what teachers do towards what students do. So we might think about um, assessment in terms of a way of, of, of certifying learning or measuring learning. And that very much places emphasis on what the teacher is doing. They will be the one grading the piece of work. They will be the one awarding the mark, entering that into the system and so on. 
Whereas, actually, if we reposition that towards something that, that students are doing, it's then about their learning. It's about what that assessment task is giving them and how it's developing their learning further. So it's a shift, really, from teacher-centred to student-centred approaches in, in um, a very broad sense. But what this shift is also about is sustainability. So there's quite a bit that's been written about in the literature on sustainable assessment and sustainable feedback. And the simple idea here with this sustainability is that the process of doing an assessment task and the feedback that we might give to students should have an impact on them long beyond that particular task. In fact, true sustainability in assessment and feedback is that it influences students when they're in the workplace um, far beyond the, the time in which they've spent um, with us as part of their educational journey. And that leads us to design assessment tasks in a very particular way so that they can have this sustainability, so that they're able to equip students with skills that mean they become much less reliant on us for assessment and feedback. If we can help students through assessment to be able to evaluate their own work, to take the perspective of a marker, to start to think about what good work looks like in their discipline, they should be able to begin to develop the skills to assess their own work or assess the work of their peers, to give themselves feedback as they're working on a task, meaning they become much less reliant on us as this definitive source of feedback. It's a difficult set of skills for students to develop, but again, we're going to think about how within the way in which we design assessments, we can give students the opportunity to develop those skills. So in feedback specifically, um, I can illustrate how we see this shift from a teacher-focused perspective to a learning-focused perspective. Um, and this is something that um, David Carlos and I have, have uh, written about in a, in a book which is coming out later this year. And we, we situate these teacher-focused and learning-focused um, approaches as an old paradigm and a new paradigm. And David Carlos um, wrote a, a, a brilliant book which came out in 2015 called Excellence in University Assessment. Um, I would recommend uh, that book. He, in this book, he uh, looked at the practice of award-winning teachers um, and looked at how they were designing assessment, what impact it was having on students. Um, so that's called Excellence in University Assessment by David Carlos. And in that book, he, he introduced this idea of the old and the new paradigm. And he argues that in higher education and in many other um, areas of education as well, we've got quite stuck in a transmission-focused way of thinking. With feedback, it's something that we do to students. We give feedback to them. And in many cases, the way in which we evaluate the quality of feedback encourages students to think about what they've received. So, um, for example, in the, in the uh, National Student Survey, students are asked to evaluate the quality of feedback in terms of receiving helpful comments about the time in which the feedback has come to them. Was it a good turnaround time? And the problem with this is that it positions students on the receiving end of feedback, rather than thinking about how they can generate and use feedback to support their own learning. And I'll come back to that point a little bit later on. So the way in which we, we, we situate this, this paradigm shift um, is in an old paradigm approach, we might think about the turnaround time for feedback comments. So, at the university where I work, we have a very strict three-week turnaround time for work to be marked and feedback to be returned to students. Now, that creates consistency across different units or modules that students might be studying, but it doesn't necessarily mean that that feedback is going to be of any use to them if they've already moved on to the next task and haven't got the opportunity to put those comments into practice. So in a new paradigm approach, rather than thinking about turnaround time, which is something very much uh, focused on what the teacher is doing. It's about making sure that the timing of feedback gives students the opportunity to apply that feedback to another task or a piece of work that they might be doing, thus putting the emphasis on what the student is doing with that feedback rather than the time in which the teacher is giving it back to them. In an old paradigm approach, we might focus on giving students really detailed comments 
So in the National Student Survey, we used to have an item which said, I have received detailed feedback. And I think it led to this belief that high quality feedback is detailed feedback. And that if we give students loads and loads of information, they'll be happy with that. And that is good feedback. But actually, there's evidence that students can be overwhelmed by too much feedback. We can kill them with kindness, almost. Um, and the messages can get lost. So it's not really about lots and lots of detailed feedback, but it's about actionable feedback. Um, in some of the work that I do, um, I work in a, a department of higher education and, and we run um, the programme for, for new lecturers. And one of the things that I will often sit down and work with tutees on is, is their feedback. And I've had many of them come to me being really frustrated because um, they've spent ages marking student work, really detailed annotations all down the side of every page of a student's essay. And then when they get their module evaluations back, the students are not giving them particularly high scores. And they, they get very frustrated. They blame the students for never being satisfied. So I'll sit down with them and say, right, let's take every one of these comments, of these annotations, and I'll ask them to explain to me what action they were expecting a student to take on the basis of that comment. What were they expecting the student to do? And in many cases, they find this very, very difficult to articulate. And looking at some of the comments, you can see why. There's things like a question mark as an annotation. Even three question marks as an annotation, which apparently means something different to one question mark. But those comments don't indicate any kind of action for the student to take. And I would argue that if a comment is not actionable, it's almost a waste of, of academic resource, it being there. Um, because it's not going to lead to any change in what students are doing. So rather than detailed comments, in this new paradigm we're thinking about actionable comments. Again, in an old paradigm, the focus is very much placed on what teachers are doing, and so it's the delivery of, of, of comments. What I'll talk about a little bit later on is giving students the opportunity to seek and generate their own feedback, situating some of that responsibility away from the teacher in initiating um, that process. Consistency of, of feedback across modules is, is a, a common old paradigm practice within feedback. Um, I've been working at Surrey for, for 10 years now, and over that time, I think we've had at least five different versions of our feedback form um, that we write our comments in. Um, and yes, that gives students a nice, uh, consistent experience across all of the modules. But it's not really dealing with that issue of how students are using feedback to support their learning. And so rather than thinking about consistency of feedback across modules, the really important thing is the connectivity of learning. Thinking about how we can join the dots of all of these different units and tasks that students might be engaged in so that they can see how feedback from one can feed into another. It's about connecting that learning so that feedback does relate to other things that they're doing. And finally, um, unfortunately, we, we, we think a lot about student satisfaction with feedback. And if we look at the metrics out there, they tell us that students are not particularly satisfied uh, with feedback. Part of that, as I mentioned earlier, I think comes back to the way in which we're framing those questions. We're asking students about what they've received, not what they've been able to do through feedback. So rather than thinking about student satisfaction, um, in a new paradigm approach, we would think about what impact feedback is having on students' learning. And one thing I would encourage you to think about is how you would know whether students were learning through your feedback. How would you know what kind of impact it was having? Now, in many cases, if we see the same students over and over again, we're able to see evidence within their work that the comments that we've given them have had some kind of impact. But other times, we might give students a task within our module or unit, then the students have moved on to do something else, another unit, and we may not see their work again. Or, as is the case at our um, institution, we mark anonymously. So we don't really get that ongoing thread of learning for ourselves about the impact that our feedback is having. So key to this new paradigm focus is thinking about how we as educators can really get a handle on the impact that our feedback is having on students. Is it leading to them thinking differently? Is it developing their skills? Is it motivating them in their learning? 
And that's quite a difficult thing to do, um, but again, I'll come back to that a little bit later on. So pulling all this together, this, this theoretical approach, it's, as I said, moving from teacher-centred to student-centred approaches, but really thinking about sustainability. How can we support students beyond this particular task so that the impact is going far forward um, and not just related to what they're doing at the moment? So the focus um, of what we'll look at today is taking an outcomes-based approach to designing learning, to designing activities, assessments and outcomes. This is a very much a, a philosophical approach to design, outcomes-based uh, learning, which is really placing the student at the centre of it and saying, right, what, what will they look like when they come to the end of this unit or this programme? And that requires us to look beyond just what they will know at the end of a, of a unit or a, a programme, um, but what they, will, what they will look like as a, as a learner. What skills will they have developed? How will their um, attitudes have changed, for example? So it's really looking to that endpoint and saying, what, what do we want to develop in students? And how are we going to get there? An outcomes-based um, approach to design is not about designing teaching, but it's about designing in learning. So looking at how we can support students to develop these skills or to develop their understanding, rather than how can we teach students how to do things. It's really putting the focus on, on their action um, rather than the action of teachers. Now, there are a couple of terms that often come up within um, outcomes-based approaches to design, assessment for learning and assessment as learning. Um, I'm just going to give you a couple of minutes to, to have a think and, and a discussion about what do you see as the difference between assessment for learning and assessment as learning? How would you define these two terms and, and what's the, the key difference between them? So um, just give you a, a two or three minutes to have a think about that. Can I ask for... Um, a couple of, of volunteers, perhaps, to, to share what you've been discussing about in terms of this distinction between assessment for learning and assessment as learning. Okay, over at the back there, could you tell us a little bit about what you were discussing? I guess we were thinking that assessment for learning is, you know, that kind of that feed forward yeah. thing of facilitating future learning. Yeah. We were more told by trying to differentiate that and assessment as learning. And possibly that, in practical terms, seems to be the more difficult thing as well. Yeah. Um, no, I, 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 absolutely, I absolutely agree with you. So, so that idea of assessment for learning is often talked about in the same um, context as, as formative assessment, that we should give students the opportunity to receive some feedback or to receive some guidance that enables them to develop perhaps that particular task a little bit further. Um, and to, to develop the way they approach it. Has anybody got any thoughts about assessment as learning um, and how that might differ from assessment for learning? We were talking about assessment as learning as very much that space of regulation of learning that through the assessment the student learns to control or to regulate mm -hmm. in some way their learning, but that might not be the right thing. No, no, no. Absolutely, so that's one of the things that definitely comes through, that, that through the process of assessment, it is as much supporting student learning as being sat in a lecture theatre and listening to somebody talk to them. It is part of the learning journey, um, and it's really indistinguishable from lots of the other things that, that we might do. Yeah. So I agree that, that with assessment for learning, we might be thinking about a particular task, a particular process, and that developing students' ability to, to complete that particular task or process. Assessment as learning, to me, is much more about um, really making assessment and, and, and taught content indistinguishable. They are both part of students' learning. And what we want to do through assessment is give students the opportunity, not just to demonstrate what they have learnt, but to learn new things. If we set assessment tasks um, appropriately, it will enable students to develop understanding, to develop new skills, 
to develop the ability to self-regulate. Um, all of those things that we want to see in our graduates, we can get them to develop those skills through the process of assessment. And so I've put a quote here from um, a paper by McLean, um, the, the references are, are on your handout, um, that really pulls this together. So assessment and learning embody cohesive design of meaningful, act, of meaningful activities. I'm going to come back to that word meaningful in a minute um, to think about what meaningful might look like in different disciplines. But through this process and bringing assessment into the learning process, means that students are developing towards those final outcomes. What we want our graduates to look like, what we want them to be able to do, how we want them to be able to think. And feedback is, is just as an integral part of that as supporting students in, in a classroom, in a seminar, through office hours. It's, it's one of those learning activities. It's not just this thing that happens at the end where we can give them a mark that leads towards certification. And so this approach um, of outcomes-based design, one example of this um, is what you might have heard about in terms of backward design or designing down. Um, and this is really the process for designing student learning within a unit or a programme, for example. And it starts with outcomes, hence outcome-based design. And those outcomes um, are very different to objectives. So learning outcomes and learning objectives. Um, objectives might relate to what we want um, within a particular a, a session, um, for example. It might relate to particular things that we're going to cover so that students will be able to demonstrate um, an understanding of, of X, Y and Z. Outcomes are really the products of the whole process not just what might go on in a particular session, but learning outcomes is really the end point of the journey. Where do we want students to be? What do we want them to look like, for example? So in this backward design approach, we start with those outcomes and think broadly about what a student will look like. Um, that question to me is always um, where I start with the design of learning outcomes is not to think about content, not necessarily even to think about skills, because I start getting bogged down in what those skills should be. But I think about a, a graduate of, of my discipline and what I aim to be able to help them develop towards. And by starting with that in mind, I will think about what that person can do, what they think like, um, what skills they've developed, what attitudes they have. And that encourages me to think quite broadly rather than just they've got to know the discipline content. Now, assessments comes next in this backward design sequence. So before we even start to think about what we're going to teach them or, or what's going to go on within the classroom, we think about those outcomes and we think about how are we going to enable students to A, demonstrate those outcomes, but B, develop them through the process of working towards an assessment. It's that key opportunity for students to further develop a skill or um, an attitude by actually doing the assessment task. Um, Phil Race writes a lot about um, students really being motivated by assessment and if they know that something's not on the exam or something isn't part of the assessment, will they engage with it? Well, that's this, this key part of aligning assessments and outcomes. If something is important and we want students to, to engage, to know, to, to be able to use a particular skill, that needs to be somewhere within the assessment to show students that we value that and also to enable them to develop that skill because by working towards the task, that's part of the way in which they will um, develop those particular attributes. So the design of assessment is really thinking about, well, what would be evidence that a student has reached this outcome? Let's give them the opportunity to demonstrate that. And if we've thought broadly enough about those outcomes, it means that we can think quite creatively about what those assessment tasks might be. How are students going to demonstrate, for example, a particular capability or attribute that we would want to see within um, a professional um, of our discipline? And then that leads finally into the design of activity. So that comes right at the end. 
We've thought about what we want students to, to be, what we want them to look like. We've thought about how we're going to give them the opportunity to demonstrate that to us. So then what are we going to do with them within our, our timetabled sessions to help them to get there? Just going to briefly talk about um, constructive alignment. Uh, constructive alignment is um, an example of outcomes-based design, um, which encourages us to think about how our assessments, our outcomes and our learning activities all link together. Again, this approach encourages us to think first of all about those outcomes, where we want students to get to, what we want them to look like, and then designing back within the process. Um, just a, a, a quick aside that um, I'm not going to talk at all about designing outcomes, um, but there are loads of really useful tools out there, things like um, Bloom's Taxonomy, which gives you sort of the verbs that, that you can put into outcomes um, and encouraging you to think about what level you want students to get to. Um, but just a, a, a quick... Um, mention of, of the, the constructive alignment approach. So one of the things that I think is really beneficial about what Biggs put together here is thinking about course learning outcomes for the whole programme and how those relate to the learning outcomes for a particular unit. And ideally, those should all be mapped and aligned as well so that students are having the opportunity across a programme not only to demonstrate um, all of the, the graduate outcomes that we would want to see, but also by connecting assessments so that they're able to use feedback from one area to support their learning in, in another unit or module. But once we get to thinking about the, the unit level, um, again, we start with the outcomes um, and what those are going to be, then coming in to design the, the assessment tasks and then learning activities and content. So again, assessments are really positioned as quite a central part of this process. The outcomes and the assessments are aligned. What happens next um, then naturally follows. So for the remainder of, of, of the session today, we're really going to focus in on these assessment tasks and think about designing assessment tasks and feedback opportunities so that we're supporting students to develop these particular learning outcomes um, that are of importance within our discipline. So that leads me on to authentic assessments and um, in a minute I'm going to give you the opportunity to, to think about what this might mean within the context of your own discipline. Authentic assessment is really a process of designing assessment tasks that are not just about giving students the opportunity to get a mark, um, but to think about how an assessment task mirrors what that student might do in um, their post-graduation professional world. Assessment tasks that mirror what people actually do within the discipline. And there are many examples of where um, assessment tasks are not particularly authentic. Um, one example that is often heavily criticised in the literature is in medical education, where students are, are very commonly assessed by multiple choice, single best answer questions which have very little relation to the kinds of skills and activities they will be doing in their professional lives. Um, so within this process of designing authentic assessment, again, we, we sort of start with outcomes, but it's a bit broader. Um, step one here says workplace context. So thinking about where our graduates might be going to and what they might be doing. Graduation profile here is the same kind of thing that I was talking about, about trying to visualise the graduates of your discipline and what they will look like and what they will be able to do. But also thinking about work requirements. So what kinds of tasks, what kinds of roles will your graduates go on to do? What kinds of things will they be doing in, in, in the workplace? And then using that to design an assessment that mirrors those kinds of activities. So creating a worthwhile task or a meaningful task something that directly relates to, to that graduate profile and those work requirements, not necessarily just writing essays over and over again, unless that could be an authentic task where in a, in a workplace someone was writing essays over and over again. Um, step three in, is thinking about judgment. So you've got this assessment task that is authentic and meaningful. How are you going to be assessing that? And it's often 
a lot more complex to assess an authentic task than it is to assess an essay or a report. Um, so thinking about criteria, but giving students the opportunity to really internalise those criteria, which is useful for two reasons. One, because they need to internalise those criteria to be able to understand what they're aiming for within the particular task. But also, if this is a meaningful workplace activity, they need to start to internalise what good performance would look like in this task or activity as part of developing towards um, a professional in that area. And then we come on to feedback, which um, I'll return to uh, in a minute. But what I want you to do now is to think about your, your own discipline and how authentic assessment might fit within the context of what your students do. Um, so I've got two resources for you. Um, one is um, a table with a, it's got a set of skills and attributes down the le left hand side. Now these are quite generic um, graduate learning outcomes um, objectives. So feel free to think about some very specific ones to your discipline if you want to. Um, so we've got things like thinking critically and making judgments, data collection and analysis. So they're very generic. Um, so you can replace them with more specific ones if you want to. Then to think about how these particular skills are utilised within the context of the workplace or the profession that your students might go on to. And I recognise that for some uh, disciplines there are almost an infinite number of, of different uh, roles that a graduate might go on to. But just think about some common ones. And how do people working in that uh, profession implement these skills? So thinking critically and making judgments. My own discipline as, as a psychologist. How would a psychologist in the workplace have to think critically and make judgments? What are the real world tasks that are associated with that outcome? And then to think about how you could mirror that in an assessment task. So the professional might be using critical thinking in a particular way and making judgments in a particular way. How could you give students the opportunity to do an assessment task that relates to that professional use um, of particular skill? Um, so I'm going to give you about um, 10, 10 or so minutes. Um, so I suggest you, you select a couple of these um, outcomes or skills to think about um, and I've also got a handout that I'll bring around which has got um, some examples of lots of different types of assessment tasks which might um, give you some ideas as to what might work in your discipline. So the aim of this um, is really just to give you an introduction to um, a set of tools that can be used in designing authentic assessment. I think the handout that I've given you, um, which is from, a, from an Australian university, is quite good in just giving representations of different types of assessment tasks that aren't just essays, um, exams and reports. But when thinking about designing an assessment, to really think about the workplace context first and what a student might be doing within the workplace to inform the type of task that you might set for students can encourage us to think beyond um, typical uh, types of assessments, particularly within a discipline. There's been some research that's, that's been done on disciplinary assessment cultures and that within disciplines there tend to be very specific ways of doing things and you know we've always done things like this and these are the kinds of tasks that we use in our discipline um, and there's no reason why it needs to be that way um, it's very easy to branch out and, and think about different tasks so my first question is um, really is, is, is there anybody who who already uses perhaps quite an authentic type of assessment task uh, within the work they do with students that they're willing to share uh, we were just talking there, I think some subjects might lend themselves naturally to what we be teaching people in software and in application. So there's a very, there's a very kind of obvious or natural link there to this is what you would have to do with it. Do you know I mean? So yeah. some might lend themselves more, you're not going to write an essay and have to program and see, you might actually get someone to program and see. So some of them might be more obvious than others. So with the app software applications, there's very much a definitely an authentic assessment is kind of more natural, I suppose. Absolutely. So if, if you are working with a group of students in a discipline where there is a very natural professional role that they, they will be going into, it's much easier to think about what those skills might look like in, in, in that context. 
it's still possible with other subjects, but I, I think the way you phrased it there was, was, was perfect, really. It's, you know, it's more obvious in some than others. Um, and it is, it is possible, but um, not necessarily as, as easily identifiable as an assessment task that really fits within um, a particular discipline. If we just take one of these, so effective written communication, I mean, that's something that, that most um, people will, will have to, to demonstrate. Effective written communication, the essay fits as, as, as a very well aligned assessment task for um, written communication. But what else could you use as an assessment task that would enable students to demonstrate effective written communication, but that isn't an essay, something a little bit more related to what students might do? Any ideas? Sorry? A blog. blog, perfect. So um, blogs are coming through as a, as a really good, authentic um, assessment task. Real benefits of, of, of using blogs um, as, a, as an assessment task. You've still got to be coherent in your writing, but you've really got to think about audience. And one of the things that students can struggle with with an essay is thinking about an audience. Um, the other thing that's really good about the blogs as well is, is that students have got to, to develop that ability to write concisely, which is a real, a real challenge. Um, and I've seen some examples of some really nice um, assessments that um, give students the opportunity to do multiple tasks and get feedback that comes together to form a, a much larger assessment task. Um, so one example I can think of is in um, psychology, where they're developing um, the skills for students to be able to communicate about scientific research to a lay audience. And so over the course of a, of a, a unit or a module, students do um, three or four short blog tasks, which are um, sort of representations of um, uh, pieces of research they've read about, and they've got to write about it for a lay audience in quite a short, short text. And then at the end, what they submit is, is a, a longer blog piece with four of these little um, critical reviews for lay audience with a little bit of a discussion at the end that is a blog, a, you know, a larger blog post. So blogs, I think that's a yeah, really, really good um, example. Anything else? Any other ways of um, giving students the opportunity to evidence effective written communication that, that doesn't involve an essay? Uh, I have students engage with what I call health assignments. It's Dilly Fong's connected. Oh, yes, to yep. So, for example, in my own discipline, which is music, um, I have a module of rock music. And students partner with a performer who's going to perform a concert in our lunchtime concert series. So they write the program note for it. Uh, they write the program details for what they want to be performed. And they also offer rationale for their choice of works. So it feeds into the course. The choice of works comes from the pool of the topic I'm discussing and engaging with. And then I leave them on to partner with the with the performer, and they have an email exchange about what to do and what they're playing, what the, what's in the performer's repertoire, but it's all from the, from the, from the period I'm discussing in class. Fantastic. So the, the, the assignment actually doesn't just engage me and the external examiner, it engages the audience, because on the day the student has the opportunity to go up and do a great concert talk as well, based on the Brilliant. Assignment. That's fantastic. I mean, that, that is so authentic. Um, and also building in so many different skills as well, um, including, I suppose, verbal communication as well in the way in which they do that. So, yeah, that's, that's a brilliant example. Thank you. Was there another one over here? I just said uh, journal clubs often the uh, opportunity to kind of summarise information in a very concise way, you know, yeah. where you write up the really an abstract from yeah. the journal and then share that. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, and all those kinds of things, which are you can see how this becomes assessment as learning because the skills that students are developing through doing that, in terms of accessing, summarising, synthesising information, um, they are learning those skills through doing things like that. So yeah, that's a great example. Thank you. So very brief introduction to, to this, but um, this kind of approach, you, know, you can replace it with any kind of outcome, and then just think about ways of, of developing. Um, assessment tasks that are just that little bit more meaningful than, than, than writing an essay, which may well be very authentic and, and is useful skill for students to develop, but throughout their whole programme of study, if they're just writing essay after essay and not being assessed in different ways, they're not developing these different skills. So just for the um, final 10 minutes or so, um, I'm going to talk about feedback and where this fits within um, this idea of outcomes-based design. And this will feed into the, the, the mapping activity um, in the workshop after the coffee break. Now, feedback um, is 
sometimes positioned as something that follows on from assessment. It happens after assessment has taken place. It's the little bit of information we give back to students. And it doesn't really have too much to do with the assessment design itself. We design the assessment and then think, well, we need to give them some feedback afterwards. So it's a bit like this example of a, of a caravan following a car. It happens after the assessment. It's sort of separate from the assessment itself. The other way of thinking about um, feedback, which is um, in this analogy would, would be sort of a camper van rather than a caravan, is that it is fully integrated with the assessment process. You can't really separate the assessment from the feedback because they're working towards the same goal and the process that we go through pulls both of these things together and it would be very difficult for us to say well that bits the assessment and that bits the feedback because actually they're, they're, they're really part of the same thing. Um, and the way in which we can, we can think about this again comes back to student learning. If we take this old paradigm view of what the teacher's doing and the transmission of feedback, um, we're often thinking about the, 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 the top diagram there, the, the separate caravan, because the student is doing the assessment and then the teacher is giving the feedback. And the feedback becomes something that the teacher does um, rather than something students are using. It also then means that the feedback is often positioned at the end of the cycle, after the assessment has been done. Whereas there are many ways of thinking about feedback that mean they come before the student has even started working on the task itself. So in the, 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 the camper van analogy where these two things are, are integrated, this cycle is not assessment then feedback, but it's all built into the same process. Multiple opportunities for feedback, not just coming from the teacher, coming from students' own self-evaluation, through peer review, um, through students requesting particular aspects of feedback. It becomes something that students are in control with, uh, control of, sorry, rather than this thing that just happens to them after they've completed an assessment task. So um, a few ways in which um, this, this can be uh, achieved, and, and we'll uh, come back to these in a little bit more depth in the workshop. Feedback for learning, um, I see as, as, as being analogous to this idea of assessment for learning. Um, that feedback for learning is something that is directly developing students, not only telling them how to do that piece of work differently, but thinking about how they're developing the skills to make judgments, to self-regulate, um, to be able to give feedback effectively to other people, which is quite a crucial graduate outcome in itself. So I'm just going to talk briefly about three considerations in this idea of, of feedback for learning and how we can build these into um, the design of, of, of curricula and, and assessments. The first is dialogue. Um, you've probably heard a lot about dialogic feedback, um, which in this context is not just about face-to-face -face, um, oral feedback. What we mean by dialogic feedback is that it's not just this one-way transmission of comments to the student. But it's a process where students are able to respond to feedback or even able to initiate that process themselves. So I've got um, a, a picture of a tennis match here to, to illustrate the fact that often in assessment and feedback, it's the teacher that makes the first move, that makes the serve, if you like. They're the ones that give the comments, send them out to the students. Students might come back to us and might talk about those, those comments with us. That's brilliant. They're returning the serve and engaging in further dialogue. But what about if we positioned the student as the person that kicks off that exchange, as the person who serves within the match? Easy way to do this is um, through what Sue Bloxham has written about um, as interactive cover sheets. And this is when a student submits a piece of work um, they have this, this, this cover sheet on the front and it starts the dialogue of the feedback exchange from the student. In some cases, there's a box that asks students to say how they've used feedback from previous work in completing the task that they're working on now. So they're sort of giving the marker insight into the process they've gone through to get to this point. 
but particularly relevant to the student starting off the dialogue is if there's a box on one of these interactive cover sheets for students to request feedback on specific elements of their work. So to say to the marker, the things I'd really like to know what you think about is X, Y, Z. So the student has to identify what the priorities are for them and it enables then the uh, marker to respond directly to those queries. There's two things, obviously, that, that might have come into your mind at this point. One is, do students necessarily know which elements of their work they most need um, marker's guidance on? And the second, which is one that I've experienced when I've trialled this, um, students are often reluctant to say what they most want feedback on because they think they're showing the marker their weaknesses on a plate. Um, so it's part of a much broader process in terms of um, what feedback means and how it's being used to support learning. Um, but there are ways in which we can uh, design tasks so that students' use of feedback and their engagement in these kinds of dialogues can actually be part of the mark that we award um, them for the, for the task. And we'll come back to this um, after the break. So interactive cover sheets is just one example of switching around the dialogue from something that's initiated by teachers to something that's initiated by students. They can make the first um, move or make the serve um, and in requesting specific feedback. The second one is building skills. Um, if we want feedback to support learning, then we need to think about how do we help students use it effectively? Um, and this is where the, the majority of, of my research has been focused over the last uh, four years or so. I think we often um, pay a lot of attention in higher education to developing students' academic skills in things like essay writing, critical thinking, citation and referencing styles, but very little examples are out there of building student skills in using feedback, which is such a crucial graduate outcome um, and really something that facilitates workplace success, not just academic success. Um, and we did a, a systematic review of the literature which we published in 2017, where we were looking at what kinds of things have been reported in the literature, practices, resources, tools, to help students develop the skills they need to use feedback effectively. And in each of the papers that we reviewed, we looked for what kind of skills were people trying to develop through these different types of interventions. And we found that there were really four key skills that were um, being developed through these approaches to developing uh, students' use of feedback, which we categorised um, into, into four uh, what we called recipient skills. The first there is self-appraisal, which is not just self-assessment, but it's actually being willing to look quite critically at yourself and recognise your strengths and weaknesses and think about how um, these might play a role in the work that you're doing. The second there is assessment literacy. So if you, need, if you want to use feedback effectively, you need to be able to take the perspective of a marker, to be able to know what good work looks like in your discipline, because otherwise you don't know how to use feedback to help you get there. Third is goal setting and self-regulation. So being able to set yourself targets for improvement on the basis of feedback, and then think about how you're gonna to develop towards those targets and adjust the strategies that you might be using if you're finding that one is perhaps not working when trying to implement feedback. And finally, engagement and motivation. So we found that a lot of the uh, interventions in our review were simply just trying to get students more willing to look at feedback in the first place. So there were lots of examples of, of technology-enhanced feedback, for example, um, to encourage students to be more willing to, to, to actually engage with feedback in the first place. Um, I put the reference to, to that on, on the handout. It's, um, it's available open access, and what we did within that paper was we looked at all of these different interventions, ranging from portfolios, peer assessment, through to things like audio and screencast feedback, and we mapped them against these recipient skills to see how these different um, resources or different interventions can be used to develop these skills within students. The final point under feedback for learning is making sure that feedback has somewhere to land. Now, I've borrowed that term from um, David Bowd, who uh, works at Deakin University in Australia. And this is really saying if we're giving students some information or some comments on their work, 
there's got to be somewhere for that feedback to go. There's got to be somewhere for them to put that into practice and actually see that it's able to um, influence what they're doing next. Now, Dave Bowd is very critical um, of the term feedback and the way it's often used. And he would argue that unless feedback is leading to students changing the way they think, the way they act, if it's not developing their skills or understanding, it's simply information. It's not feedback. Because feedback requires that changed output, that something happens differently. Otherwise, it's just information. And similarly, back in 1970, Roy Sadler talked about um, a very similar idea of feedback that isn't used as dangling data. It's just information that we push out there and hope that something happens with it. But if it doesn't do anything, it, it just isn't feedback. So in designing um, feedback for learning, one of those important considerations is where are students going to be able to use this feedback? Where can it land so that they actually have an opportunity to use that information um, and to demonstrate to us that they've done so?